Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm joined by musician, comedian, and writer Josh Harmon. Josh, welcome to the show. Hello. <laughs> so thank you for uh, joining me. I think people probably know you most um, from your social media, where you really do some amazing... Um, I don't even know how to describe it. I guess you recreate the sounds of movies and scenes and clips, um, which kind of has a, uh, a a trap drummer feel. My history brain yeah. goes to that, but um, that's hey, you're you're that kid who does those scratching noises <laughs> in his parents' basement. <laughs> uh, I, I think I've seen you. Yeah, that's that's me. Well, it's super cool. I think you found a a very niche way to um, you got to stick out. You're obviously a great drummer. You're a funny guy. You're a comedian. You you get that you you go, you have good timing comedically and you know you drumming Lee. So I think it's really cool that you did that. Yeah, and I I mean it's been a really fun and interesting exploration, which has led me to places I never thought I would go. So it's it's really been just so much fun, the whole project. Yeah, I mean, and and obviously, uh, we're not going to be talking a lot about that today, because I you, you have talked about that on other shows. And of course, that's kind of what our deal on the show is, is we don't do like, I mean, that's pretty modern. So we're here to talk about history stuff. But I got to say, I mean, you have 412,000 followers on um Instagram. I haven't looked at your YouTube. I'm sure it's huge. Oh, you have on TikTok 2.4 million. I mean, man, you're you're a you're an influencer. You're you know you're a big deal. <laughs> I actually eschew the term influencer. Because, <laughs> I know. I just wanted to say yeah. it too. Well, we don't need to. Get, we, we can we can save that <laughs> conversation for later. Yeah. Well, I think we'll talk more about Josh's um, celebrity status maybe in the bonus episode we'll do for Patreon, but. Okay, so today's topic, though, uh, you may be asking yourself, if you're the listener, what does this um, social media phenom, this 25-year-old from New Jersey, know about the history of French drumming? Um, I learned about your, I guess, you know, passion in this from listening to your interview on the Working Drummer podcast with Matt and Zach, uh, who are both on the Drum Click podcast network, which I'm a part of. Um and you talked about a documentary that you worked on, and I was just like instantly like that's ex- that's what I'm talking about. That's more my thing uh, for this show. And I reached out to you, and uh, you were happy to come on the show. So, all that being said, tell us about it. How did you get into French drumming? Like with your background, because you're you're a young guy. You don't have that much room for that much of a background. So, how yeah. did you get into this? <laughs> it's all it's all foreground. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're in the foreground. Uh, and I'm also not French, so yeah. it is a, a weird thing, but I also just want to say I'm just, <laughs> I'm like smiling and giggling to myself right now because this is something that I got into my senior year of college, and whenever I would bring up French drumming, my friends would roll their <laughs> eyes so much like, oh my God, please just shut up about the French <laughs> drums, it's enough, and now someone has finally said, Josh, tell us what yeah. you know about this. And so it's a nice feeling. Look at you now. Look at me now. (laughs) Suck it, everybody. It's a big deal. (laughs) French drums. Uh, Yeah. yeah. So basically, it was a thesis project that I did my senior year at Amherst College, which is where I went, a wonderful school where I had an absolutely wonderful time. And I was majoring in French literature, which is also very niche and sort of strange from if you look at it from the outside. Yeah. But I knew that I wanted to do a thesis and I knew sort of that I wanted to talk about music, maybe the rhythm of poetry or something like that. And then one day I just said, well, you know, it's, it's a shame that there's no French drum thing. It's a bummer that France doesn't have some sort of rich drumming tradition because then I would love to write about that. And that was just a thought I had. And then I said, well, actually, I don't know. Let me look it up. And so I just got to Googling and I read a couple of books that kind of mentioned it in passing and it piqued my interest a little bit. And then I just sort of really caught the bug and wanted to know all about it. Hmm. Um, I'll just say off, off the top that rhythm and drums is such a fascinating thing because it's so universal but yeah. also it's so distinct everywhere you go. Every, you know, every society, every nation 
uh, every city has its own uh, style of drumming, its own rhythms. And every drum itself, every uh, type of percussion instrument has its own unique story in terms of how it developed. You know, you go back to prehistory, wherever humans settled, they brought their instruments, their drums with them. And as such, the history of percussion is linked to that of the history of mankind yeah. itself. And as people move around, so do the rhythms that they play. And it's, you know, it's such a profound thing, I think, that, you know, when you study a society's rhythms, you study the music of a culture, it reveals a lot about people's heritage and you gain an insight into that people, which is not only musical, but it's also historical, social, and political. Yeah, and that's, so, I mean, I just immediately think, like, I think a lot of people are thinking like New Orleans or these things where right. it's, they're just building on top of each other and then you're mixing and then you get something new and then, you know. It's a the veritable road. palimpsest, yes. <laughs> you took the words right out of my <laughs> mouth. Um, uh, but yeah, but, all, you know, people swing differently in New York than they do in New Orleans, right? Just yeah. within the context of jazz. People funk differently in Oakland versus in Minnesota. Mm-hmm. And so... This is now I'm talking about military snare drumming. People play the snare drum, the military snare drum in France much differently than they play it in, let's say, Switzerland or Germany. And what I found in my research was that the differences, like the, let's say the swing that you hear in uh, New York versus New Orleans is, it's, you know, sometimes drastic, but the difference between the snare drumming in France versus other European nations is extremely, it's like very stark. Hmm. And that is what piqued my interest, really. Um, yeah. I read this book by a historian named John Norris. He has a book called Marching to the Drum. He writes, all European nations eventually adopted military drums, but the French developed fascination with the drum almost to the point of obsession. Hmm. When I read that, that kind of kicked off my thesis question. Because I know that the drum, like the snare drum, is not a French thing. It comes from the Arab world. Hmm. If you learn about the history of the snare drum, sure. Uh, and yet, by the time of the French Revolution, the time of Napoleon, the French—it's called le tambour. If I use my French accent, le tambour <laughs> uh, is something that's extremely quintessentially French. How is this possible? How did this come to be? That's sort of was the opening question of my thesis, which I then set out to answer. That's a good, I mean, and we talked about those, you know, the the tambour or whatever, you know, with your accent on um, various episodes. And um, it is interesting, but I think it's one of those things where it got created and, you know, yes, you can take it back to certain roots, but it's so just, it belongs to everyone. In a way, in a weird way, you know what I mean. Where then they modify it, and it's it's sort of uh, um, it's evolved into such such different things. Now, can we jump into the um, what your thesis was? Can we can we go back to the beginning of you know the French drumming and really start to go through some some different decades and centuries? I guess on oh, on, on this yeah. topic. Oh, talk about drum history. Sure, maybe I thought we <laughs> might start there. <laughs> Okay, yeah, so I think it might be useful to, I guess, give a cursory overview of why drums were even being used in battle. So here we're talking about military snare drumming, the rudimental drum tradition that goes back to drums on the battlefield, signaling to the soldiers, giving them messages. So by the 17th century or so, Infantry units were increasing, and I'm talking about you know warfare kind of in the abstract. It's sort of weird to think about now, mm-hmm. um, but warfare in those days, you know, 15th, 16th, 17th century, it really was a weird kind of thing. There were all these. There was etiquette to it. It's very strange because people are yeah. killing each other, and it's horrific. But there were all these. There was almost decorum to it. Mm-hmm. Um, but by the 17th century. Battles are being fought across larger expanses of land than ever before. Like, armies are getting bigger. The scale of war is increasing. Um, and as a result, verbal commands, you know, a general just shouting to charge or to retreat is no longer going to fly. It's not going to carry uh, the distance it needs to go. And, you know, popular before that, 
They would use semaphores, right? Waving flags. Red means this. This means that. Famously, white, it, we're surrendering. Um, and so that had been popular. Napoleon did use semaphores, but mm. why would we need a drum? Why would we need a musical instrument on the battlefield? Well, number one, you need something that's really loud. And two, you need something that isn't visual because now as warfare is evolving, muskets and cannons are getting incorporated. Now the battlefield is clouded in gunpowder smoke. So mm-hmm. it's really hard to see. Yeah. So if you want to tell your 1,000 soldiers, we have to get out of here, we have to retreat. The easiest way to do that, instead of just shouting it and playing telephone, is to have a musical instrument on the battlefield. Hmm. Yeah, that's not a good time for telephone to go wrong. And so right. get the wrong message. You go, March forward? No, the other way. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and I find this to be extremely interesting just as a concept because we, you often hear about music as a language, but this is literally music as a language. Yeah, absolutely. This rhythm means this. You know, I yeah. play two paradiddles and then eighth notes. That means turn right. You know, how does that work as far as training the frontline infantry, if that would be what they're considered then? the language of the drummer you know what i mean like do you go this is what you need to hear and they're like oh did he just do a paradiddle or did he just do or you know like how did they being the non-drummers the soldiers how do they learn that that's that's i don't know if you know that it's it's very interesting and actually it will come up later in my Uh, grand story okay we'll carry on (laughs) but i don't want to spoil the the juicy details Uh, okay of the french tambour yeah so um Yeah. Now, this is just sort of an interesting little tidbit. So now we have drums and bugles and bagpipes on the battlefield as we're sort of walking through timeline of medieval European warfare. Um, Drums become the, like, basically overtakes the bugle and the trumpet as a chief signaling device of the battlefield. Mm -hmm. Why? Why do you think? Why? why? I'm asking you, Bart. Why? Um you're asking me why does why would a drum be more useful in battle than say a trumpet to basically do the same thing i would say maybe that uh, my gut thinks that it's it's it projects further but i don't know about that because the you know trumpet can project pretty pretty far maybe it's easier to give someone a pair of drumsticks and they can just hit a drum in a, a certain way than it is to train them on how to play a a trumpet those are excellent guesses and it is you would think, you know, trumpet, you have melody and also rhythm. You could pack so much more information there. Mm-hmm. But the answer is really because a drum doesn't require breath. And as a result, it's a lot easier to play for uh-huh. long periods of time and also while marching yeah. long distances. Interesting. And when I went to the archives at the Musée de l'Armée in Paris to learn all of this, the Army Museum, they have huge, huge archives letters, documents um, from every war that France has ever been in. There's a, a letter that I found in there where one of these, he's like a military inspector general. He's writing to another person in another regiment. And he's saying, I know the drum is great, but we really should hold on to the trumpet and have at least a few trumpeters in every regiment. And I'll ask you another question, Bart. Why do you think that would be the answer as a drummer, will will tickle you a little bit. I mean, I immediately thought, well, if all the drummers get killed, you need a backup. Um, <laughs> that, yeah, it's, that is a, uh, that would make sense. Yes, and actually, it once drummers became really a part of the army, it was a strategy that the opposing side would try to kill the drummers first. Mm. That was always the goal: kill the drummer, because then they can't communicate with each other. Yeah, I mean, that you think of, I think of like a movie, like uh, Behind Enemy Lines or something. I always think of that movie where they're like, they're shooting the person who's running the line that's to uh, connect for radio signals and all that stuff so that messages don't get through. I mean, I feel like that cutting communication is about as just pure like military tactic as you can get. So that makes perfect sense. But yeah, what is the answer? The answer, I just find this, I don't know, to be hilarious. It's that if it rains, the drum head gets wet and then it's not as loud. (laughs) 
Man. And that was the reason that uh, they decided to keep trumpets and bugles in the military tradition. Wow. That, yeah. If only they had mylar. Yeah, right. <laughs> but back then they're using, you know, animal hide. Yeah. Um, yeah. Interesting. Wow. Yeah. That's fascinating. I'm sure they had a rifle or something or would be contributing out. They wouldn't just be right. sitting there and, you know, on the bench waiting to go in. Um, yeah. Uh, and by the way, you mentioned like killing drummers, cutting off communication. In Napoleonic times, that was considered a huge badge of honor. If you could capture an enemy drum, that's like, oh, wow. you know, uh, I guess in ancient times, like holding up somebody's head, you know, <laughs> oh, we got like, that yeah. was sort of the the thing. Like, oh, if I can bring home this, or I think of you know, dumb college students trying to steal uh, a statue or something. Yeah. And like, as a, that was sort of a thing that people or soldiers would try to do as a badge of honor. And Napoleon also started this tradition where he would award soldiers who had been particularly brave, basically like a medal of honor type thing. He would give commemorative decorative drumsticks oh, to wow. soldiers who he found to be of note, which I think is quite interesting. That's so, so Napoleon clearly had, you know, respect for drummers and understood the, you know, importance of them. Absolutely. Hmm. Yeah. Um, and you could say that he wielded music exceptionally well to do what he did. All right. Wait. So explain that a little bit. Napoleon wielding music better than others. So obviously, I, didn't, I never really thought about this. So someone who can use music better to communicate, and I'm assuming this is what you mean, better to communicate and get people moving and, and get his message across faster. That would the importance of that is that if he's doing it better than, let's say, you know, a general who is not doing that, it he's just moving his chess pieces on the board, you know, uh, better than someone else. Is that kind of what that means? I think, yeah. Basically, the you really can't overstate the importance of the military drum in these types of battle situations because number one, it keeps it well it gives important orders right turn left retreat mm -hmm. we're out of here we're going in yeah but also marching huge distances napoleon conquering all these places that requires a tremendous amount of just marching for miles and miles and miles how do you get people to do that it's through a hypnotic repetition of the drum beat hmm. one foot in front of the other and if you have great drummers it's easier to get your soldiers to do that wow it's not something that anyone would you know willingly do walk like, hundreds of miles and to, and then to go into almost certain death but there's something about the drum that sort of stirs up courage yeah. out of nowhere and you can't help yourself puts a little pep in their step as they're walking into a battle <laughs> yeah it puts a little pep in your little, little <laughs> skip in your <laughs> yeah no that's kind of a sad thing yeah. to talk about uh, it is it's all very morbid but it is also i think interesting that the instrument that we play comes from mm -hmm. this. Yeah, you for know? sure. The snare drum is part of every drum set, and this is the root of the snare drum. So much killing and death and violence. Mm. Yeah, really. And you think about the instrument now, and it's really used as a tool for unification and love and dancing yeah. and keeping people together. That's, That's a great point. Um, so as in the in the history timeline, though, what we're talking about so far isn't exactly specifically just French. But I guess what we're talking about uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, though, is, is what makes it so important in the French history is just how well it was used. Correct. OK, then carry on from there. So this is sort of the, the turning point um, where the French style and when I was first getting started, I was, there were only a few sort of excerpts that I could find online of, you know, examples of French drumming, you know, books that have been written with the patterns in them. And you look at them, they're so complicated. There's groupings of five, there's, you know, crazy mm -hmm. nested tuplets, incredibly complicated patterns that would be extremely difficult to sight read, even for an experienced player. Whereas you look at, I don't know, mm -hmm. Wilcoxon, for example, um, something that's very American, even from 200 years later, 
And it's kind of like triplet, triplet, eighth note, eighth note, yeah. triplet, triplet, sixteenth note. So that was really blowing my mind. And I wanted to know why that is. And in my research, what I found out is that it really came down to two military events that ended up elevating the French style of military drumming above all the others. So the first one is this battle in 1515. Yeah. So we're going way back. Um, the Battle of Novara, which is um, in this war, which is nobody even really talks about. It's not even really that relevant, but it's, this is the war is fought. It, the battle was fought in Italy. And basically what happened was that the French got absolutely demolished. They were disorganized. They were running all over the place, not functioning as a unit. And they got destroyed by the Swiss army who came in and they were using drummers. They were the first country to have drums in their, in their army and use them pretty effectively. And in this battle was Francis I, who would later become King Francis I of France, King of France. He's there. Mm -hmm. He survives the battle, obviously. And um, he sees this Swiss regiment come in, marching in unison, super organized, and just systematically, they, they just wiped out mm. the French people in this battle. And when he became king, he would remember that very distinctly. And he wrote about it in his letters. Um, and he was the one who said, okay, we need to step up our drum game if we're going to be serious as a military nation. And so he then starts this process and he commissions this guy whose name was Arbo to write a bunch of patterns for the French army that would be you know, unique to France. And the guy writes these rhythms, um, which are very interesting to look at and to play. They all use what's called the Pyrrhic, which is something that you get from poetry because this guy Arbo was a poet. He basically, he writes these rhythms, which have a, a Pyrrhic form, which is like a accented and then a less accented note, one after another, like da 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 da, which he deduced was the ideal sort of form and style to get people marching, that kind of thing, as opposed to da 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 da. It's kind of off balance. Yeah. Put the accent on the first one, on the first note of the duple meter. It's just something about it was better, more conducive to marching. So he wrote all these patterns with that in mind. And what's very interesting, if you look at the poetry from the time, when those rhythms start to get incorporated and start to get heard all over the, you know, the land, it up, then starts appearing in literature and in poetry. Hmm. So the rhythms that he wrote for the military actually end up in literature. You wow. start to see a lot of Pyrrhic forms in French uh, lyrics and poems, which I think is just fascinating. Oh, that is fascinating. It's amazing how... I mean, even today, even the use of like the internet, I mean, everything kind of has like ba a basis in the military in some weird way. You know what I mean? Uh, I, yeah, I, I, I think I do. <laughs> no, I just mean, cause it, the, it, like these inventions that we use right. come back to that. Obviously I'm, you know, the internet, it was many, many, many <laughs> years later, but, um, and also it's, it's cool to note that like, man, the Swiss army We've talked about them on the show before. They sound like a pretty, you know, badass group of people who are just really, 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 really put together. Um, so it's neat to hear that they influenced uh, the French army um, with their sheer killing power. Yeah. The, I mean, the Swiss were so good that they would hire themselves out to other countries. Exactly. Mercenaries, basically. Yeah. Um, which is hilarious. It's like... We're so good at fighting that you can hire us to do your fighting <laughs> for you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and they really did. They were, the Swiss drummers were exceptional and mm. they got those people in line. And that's, I think it's really a big part of why they were so effective. Yeah. So, that, so now, okay, we're, we're plowing ahead with our story. Yeah. Now we have these lovely poetic rhythms that are <laughs> French and they're, the, French army has music and it's, and it's lovely and they're more efficient and they're more organized. This is the real turning point of the story of the French tambour, 
which is in the War of Spanish Succession. Basically, the Spanish king dies, no heir. Everyone's going to kill each other, figure out what's going to go on. What's gonna, what the hell's going to happen here, <laughs> right? Europe just descends into absolute chaos. And there was a battle in 1708, the Battle of Oudenard in Belgium, where the Allied forces, that's the Anglo-Dutch-Austrian forces, the drummers in those regiments played the French tat- like drum tattoo, the, mm-hmm. l- the retraite, the retreat, <laughs> so convincingly that part of the French army did, in fact, retreat. Ah. So it was a very clever tactic. They essentially imitated the French drum call to retreat to get the French people to leave, <laughs> wow. which is exactly what happened. Man, how did they, would, would they have gotten these rhythms? I mean, obviously, they're a drum. You can hear it from really far, but um, would they have, it'd be, it's crazy. It's almost like a movie where someone sneaks in and steals their music and then they learn it. And you know what I mean? Like, I, I wonder how right. that, that actually happened. Yeah, I, I don't know the particulars of it, but it would make a great movie. But I also think it's just, as you said, the drum is really loud. And if all it would take, you're a drummer, you hear it once. Keep in mind, the drum calls at the time were all pretty simple. Yeah, It was like, three beats means go right. And, uh, you know, if I start playing 16th notes, we're, we're charging the head. Hmm. So it wouldn't be so difficult for someone to figure out what it was. But would the the reason someone would get more fancy with it and and have it be more unique to would would it be to make it harder so people couldn't mimic it and throw people off? I mean, is that part of it? That's exactly what happened. Hmm. So following this defeat, where the French were like, "What the hell just happened? <laughs> we got hoodwinked." The king of France at the time he decides, okay, well, the solution then is to make our drum signals so complicated that no one could ever possibly (laughs) copy them. And that's exactly what they did. Interesting. And so um, he, much in the way that King um, Francis I, this is, uh, I believe now, so King Francis I hires this guy Arbo to write the rhythms. This The King of France at that time, it was Louis... And Louis the 13th or 14th. Basically, he hires this guy to write the most complicated drum music that's ever been written. Mm. Like insane. And he gathers this guy and a bunch of other top drummers and invites them all to Versailles. And essentially has, I don't know, a NAM show. <laughs> <laughs> a big conference where they're going to basically not leave until they have all learned it and figured out you know, this is the new French drum style and it's incredibly complicated mm. and we're going to learn it here and we're going to write it down, codify it, make it official and then go and teach it to everybody. Wow. It's more of a PASIC than a NAM, I'd say. Yeah. Yeah. PASIC. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it wasn't not, not necessarily about gear. Although, <laughs> yeah. There was gear, I'm sure. So anyway. There, oh, yeah. Um, there is actually a thing where they started. That was the first instance, I believe, of the brass snare drum to make it even louder. Oh, wow. 1767, French decree, we're no longer using wood, we're going to use brass. <laughs> yeah. And they also mandated, they were very particular about what they wanted. Okay. They mandated new sizes for what the cylinder is going to be, 46 centimeters by 38 centimeters. Uh, so they made the drum smaller, but made of brass. Gotcha. I imagine too, it would have been similar to in America where there might have been uh, contracts for drum makers, similar to like Noble and Cooley, where it's like, mm-hmm. um, you're now making a ton of brass drums. Get to it. Um, right, exactly. Yeah. All right. Like you said, we're in the mid 1700s. Is that right? Mid 1700s. Okay, yeah. Carry on. Basically, that is essentially the the big reason is that this the king had the idea to make the drum calls so complicated that no one would be able to copy them. And he also wrote them down, like, uh, which is a big step because previously there hadn't been that much just pure snare drum music written down. Mm-hmm. Now we think about it, oh, we have all these books, all the snare drum music, but it really wasn't that big of a thing. Um, and now they're written down and it's incredibly complicated. And what I think is really interesting is that this document that was created at Versailles with the brand new, new and improved French military drum calls has tempo markings interesting and beethoven 
is often credited as being the first person to put like an exact tempo marking on a piece of music, which he did in 1817. But this document, which is called the, the Instructions for Tambour, Les Instructions pour les Tambours, in 1754, has a tempo marking. It says um, basically 60 beats per minute. Wow. Yeah. But the way it's written, it says um, basically 60 beats per minute. That is to say, with one step every half second. That makes so it's, sense. Yeah. It's related. And I find this very interesting. And I then saw this very much. It's still in the modern day with the people who are still playing drums in the French style. Is that this sense of time, keeping time, is very connected to the body mm-hmm. and the movement of the body. Yeah. Um, because that's the... Like nowadays, playing the drums and, and stuff, it's obviously about having fun and getting better as a drummer, but you know, the main goal is to make people dance and really right. support the music. The main goal then was to make people move, but move in battle and direct them. And, and you know, I wonder, as you're saying this, there had to be times where, I mean, you're, you know, yeah, you're practiced, you're at your, you know, 1700s French PASIC, you know, and you're, yeah. you're <laughs> but okay, get on a battlefield where people are getting shot and there's blood all over and stuff. I wonder how Mm -hmm. much of the most difficult music of the time with, you know, uh, tempo markings kind of goes out the window or if they were pretty tight still, I don't know if that's documented. Yeah, that I I don't know. I mean, assume it was crazy. (laughs) I, I, you have to imagine that everything just goes out the window, but I guess it's the function of the drummer sort of in the same way that the drummer might function in the band, like the gigs going off the rails, everything's crazy. The drummer's got to hold it together. Yeah. So good point. Your friend's head's getting blown off. You're the drummer. It's your responsibility. You have to keep people, uh, you know, in the right tempo. Yeah. And so yeah. it's interesting. I find a lot of parallels between this tradition, which is, which we're so far removed from now, this idea of, you know, European warfare, rifles and muskets and snare drums and marching, all this stuff that's so far removed from my reality. Mm -hmm. And yet, because I play the drums, I'm connected to it. And it is a part of our history. And I just find that, you know, why would someone want to study this? Because there are a lot of parallels and a lot of practical things that you can learn from it, from anything. If you go deep into any historical, uh, section any any if you go if you go deep you know historically into any type of music you end up just learning a lot yeah and it, and it, yeah that's that's neat to put it like that i mean basically you doing sound effects for a tom and jerry cartoon is basically connected to french warfare um from hundreds of years ago on tiktok right yeah in a way it, it really is one i think about that original idea of we need some way to communicate that's going to cut through this melee there's pe- there's guns being fired and every it feels like just everything is so crazy. How are we going to get through to everyone? It's through the drum. Mm-hmm. The drum is going to cut through. And I feel as though I've taken a similar approach in the melee of social media <laughs> that somehow the drum has cut through. I Totally. It's just there's something about it. Yeah. The thing about the drums, it really is a unifying force. I mean, for good or for evil, depending on the historical context. Yep. Uh, there's something about the drum. It's so intrinsically human. People are drawn to it. Yeah. And it does. It just cuts through. Yeah. Yeah, um, for sure. I mean, it's it's an impressive instrument and it's visually very cool. One more thing which I can say, which yeah. is a more direct uh, correlation. Yes. So, question I get all the time, which is, Josh, why do you have a bandana on your snare drum? Mm-hmm. I do that in a lot of my videos. Sure. Drummers, we know it mutes the sound, makes it a little quieter. Number, well, one, I... I I live with my parents, and so I try to make my uh, recording a little bit quieter just for, <laughs> for their sake. Also, you know, it just gives me a better sound for what I'm trying to do. Yeah. I learned that from watching videos of Ringo. He always had... Oh, the tea towels. Yeah, the tea towels. But I learned in this research that that was actually invented by the French military snare drummers. Whoa. Because they would use drums to communicate everything, not just in the fray of battle. It was also where this is what you play to wake everybody up in the morning. And this means, okay, we're off duty. We can go to sleep. They gave all the announcements through the drum. But sometimes you don't want that announcement to be so loud that people could hear it for miles, but you just want to 
sort of say it to the people who are with, you know, within a couple hundred feet of you. Wow. And so they, the solution was to put a piece of cloth and it's documented in letters that they have in these archives. Drummers written to other drummers about this, about how if you put a piece of cloth, it makes it a little quieter. And so a lot of times that's what they would do when they were playing the drum tattoo, which meant to break down camp, we're going to march now. Yep. Because you don't want everyone to know that that's if anyone might be listening. Fascinating. Man, that's awesome. That's, those are those little pieces of like within an episode where you're kind of like, oh man, that just applies to so much stuff. And that, that history of like, of like, yeah, anyone does that. I mean, everyone is a, a gig and you throw a t-shirt over your snare or whatever, like a, you know, a bandana or something. And um, that's a little bit of French, you know, drum history every time you're playing your, your kit. Um, Gives you a little je ne sais quoi. <laughs> exactly. This episode is brought to you by Burn Cymbals. In this spot, I'm playing the 20-inch Vintage Series Ride. This is by far the nicest ride I have ever owned. It works great at live gigs and on recordings with a beautiful vintage sound and look. These are handcrafted American cymbals that are created from Turkish bronze and gradually shaped with thousands of hammer blows and laved by hand in Cleveland. Find them online at burncymbals.com to check out the Vintage Series that I'm using and all the other different lines they offer and to find a dealer near you. Also, check them out on Instagram at Burn Symbols, spelled B-Y-R-N-E. We're basically in the 1600s, 1700s. Um, what is the personnel like? I want to know, and I guess it would be more, um, I don't know, kind of a civil war thing in America, but a lot of times people think of, of drummers, they think of the drummer boy, which I think I do think I've learned over time that it's kind of a bit of a misconception where mm. a lot of them weren't. There were young ones. There was Orion P. Howe, who I did an episode on, who, you know, got the Medal of Honor, for, you know, for his bravery. And he was like 12 or 13. But that being said, um, there were older and younger people, too. Did they have that same drummer boy uh, kind of? Uh, romantic notion that that we have with our war history and drummers, or were they typically just grown men who were learning these difficult, uh, you know, pieces of music? It was mostly yeah, adult men, basically the same as the other soldiers. And they were also paid the same amount. Mm. The French soldiers were all paid. Interesting. And they were, the drummers would get paid the same amount as the soldiers. In which I think is sort of telling, meaning that their work is just as important as a soldier's work. Yeah. Um, honestly, if not more important, yeah. but I'm a drummer, so I'm, I'm biased, yeah, we, but yeah, uh, that's cool. Yeah. Okay. There are a lot of um, little anecdotes about, you know, heroic drummers uh, who do, who, you know, play the drums with such ferocity that they encourage the whole regiment to march. What do you, you know, all this stuff. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and it's usually just, I don't know actually where the that image of the little drummer boy comes from. I think that's sort of a weird American thing. Yeah, and, and again, I, I think there is, there is truth to it, but I think maybe some of those stories of um, kids got a little bit blown out of proportions where there are other, I mean, there's plenty of grown men doing it. Yeah, so I think that's, in terms of the overall, like this back history portion of it, that's probably a good place to kind of cap it sure essentially yeah. it doesn't get that much more interesting from from then on it's sort of just okay now it's incredible like the french has this beautiful flowery uh, ornate snare drum music that they're using in the battlefield and it just gets progressively more and more refined from there there aren't any major events or, or anything that happens between i mean there's napoleon and he sort of continues and he refines it more yeah um but it's it it does it sort of declines in how fascinating it is. Sure. What year do we jump ahead to? Well, we can jump ahead to uh, tw <laughs> 2018. <laughs> okay, that's a serious jump. Uh, Major jump. <laughs> you can jump right to 2018. Sounds good. Because I would love to talk about my trip to France. Yeah, because you worked with a teacher who uh, I've watched. And we'll, you know, you, you basically have a documentary that you've worked on. But it, you, you had a pretty cool experience. Yes. Just through my Googling, I found that there's a school for French drumming uh, located in Brittany, which is in the northwestern part of France. And I 
wrote to them on Facebook Messenger, which is the only way I could contact them. And I said, hi, I'm Josh. I'm this American kid, and I'm really interested in French drumming. Could I talk to you at some point over Skype? And then two weeks later, I get a message back from this man named Yvonne Roussel. And he goes, bonjour, Josh. And it's written in like this Breton French dialect. So I can't even Google translate it. And I don't know half the words. <laughs> and I mean, my French is pretty good, but I really had a hard time understanding that, understanding what he was writing, yeah. okay, let alone then when I went to meet him. But basically he said, oh my God, that's fantastic. It's so wonderful that someone from America is interested in this. We'd love to invite you here to learn from us personally. And this was like, oh my God, are you serious? And he's like, yes, be here on this date. <laughs> wow. Uh, like January 18th, like in Brittany here in this town called Saint-Brieuc. Uh, so I was like, okay, I bought a plane ticket and I went and I flew across the world to take a drum lesson. It's awesome. Oh, to be young. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and also to have a thesis budget. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and it ended up being, I mean, one, it was just sort of like a cool thing I did on a lark, but it really, that's at least what's what I thought it was going to be. But it ended up being one of the most profound experiences of my life. Just because, I mean, I've had a lot of incredible drum teachers over the years and a lot of great teachers who have all taught me wonderful things and improved my perspective, my ability on the instrument. But this was a whole other thing. And it really sort of, you know, caught me off guard from the left side. Yeah, I'm sure. So go into it. What What is, you know, what happened? What is the technique? What tell us about the teacher? I mean, I remember just like, I think in the documentary, there's a part where you ask, like, doesn't that, isn't that going to hurt your arm if you do it like that? And he's like, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's this, it was this guy, Yvonne, and his sort of partner, whose name is Pierre-Yves Le Chenadec. <laughs> they were the most French people I've ever met. And also, they're older in their 70s. Um, impossible to understand. <laughs> Truly so difficult. Yeah. I spent the whole day. I also had that day, which is maybe why it was so profound. I had a 104 fever. Oh, my God. Uh, which is kind of a funny story. Pre-COVID. Guess, <laughs> this is pre. This is, yeah. yeah. Pre. Um, it was, it was well pre COVID. Yeah. Um, but I had actually, I had taken some Tylenol and had a, I took French Tylenol, had a bad reaction to it. Oh, geez. I guess it's a little different. So this guy, Yvonne, he has a limp, like his leg is messed up from an injury. His hand is paralyzed and he's also deaf in one ear. Hmm. So he cannot really hear the drum. He can't march with it. And he also can't play. Jeez. But he but he did in his younger years, obviously. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But he is really the last living grandmaster of this tradition that the French are very proud of. Um, at least those who know about it. This thing, because at that conference in the 1700s, when they decided to codify and make this make this new style of military drumming. That then became really imbued into the French culture. But over the years, it's sort of fallen out of favor. Obviously, like there's no more like drummers on the battlefield. It's really dwindled in terms of who knows about it, who knows the technique, who knows the history. And this guy, Yvonne, is sort of like the last stalwart of trying to preserve it. And that's what he's doing at his school. Hmm. And so even though he physically can't do it anymore, he's still doing it. And so he has people who help him teach. And this guy, Pierre-Yves, who was his friend and who works with him, was the man who was kind of, would play the example. So Yvonne would say, and now we're going to do this. Pierre would demonstrate it and help me. And Yvonne would sort of just be watching. Hmm. So it was a really interesting dynamic. So you're, just to explain, or just to like clarify a little bit, the like what it is, is he's yeah. teaching you that same, like you said, that at that that where they said we got to step up our game and we need we they got mimicked and someone they got you know it was a brutal battle because they basically listened to an incorrect you know the other side tricked them with the uh, the drumming 
they went to that convention. They had, uh, you know, quote unquote convention. They learned this very embellished patterns and all this stuff. He's teaching you that style. He's one of the last people who is really keeping that alive, right? Right. Got it. Um, basically, the way they hold the stick is kind of strange. They just sort of grip it in their fist, like in the middle of it. Huh. And then it's traditional grip. So the left, if you're righty, left stick is, uh, you know, you held it underneath the stick. Kind of in this, what I found to be sort of similar to the traditional grip that I knew mm-hmm. just as an American player. But the right hand is really weird. It's you're over the top of it in a fist, but extremely relaxed. And you play, you strike the drum by rotating your hand sideways. So it's sort of like from your shoulder. Hmm. It's a, really a rotation of the radius ulna in the arm. Kind of the same way that when you play with your left hand, traditional grip, and you're rotating your hand, yeah. you're basically doing the contrary motion now with your right hand. So both are going side, like um, twisting sideways as opposed to striking up and down. Yeah. It's all sideways. God, it's kind of w- weird to like, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here doing it, obviously, <laughs> as we're talking. Yeah, and, windshield wiper kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, but I, I feel like that, that, that grabbing it with a... F- fist and just playing is almost how like someone who hasn't really held a drumstick before picks up a drumstick and starts not really that side you know what i mean like where it's like no yeah. no, no, you don't hold it like that you hold it like this but it seems like you wouldn't get as much control or but obviously that's the, that's the thing which is that and that's what i really struggled with during this lesson which was a 12 hour <laughs> affair oh, let me just say that okay so one drum lesson <laughs> though like you went to france for a 12 hour lesson <laughs> it was all day I have never been more exhausted after anything in my whole life. They just kept giving me stuff. Wow. Eventually, I was like, I really, I need to leave. Yeah, I'm just, sick. <laughs> <laughs> well, also, it was, uh, you know, it's these two guys. I don't know how often they get someone from another country being like, hey, I'm really interested in what you do. Yeah. <laughs> so, they were just thrilled wow. that, you know, and they wanted to teach me everything. So, yeah, it's this weird technique. Also, in the French style, no buzz rolls, no buzz. Mm. Everything is straight diddle. So you're using your wrist, the, basically the, the foundation of it is to have a very relaxed and very flexible wrist. So they have, there's all sorts of, like, they taught me these stretches to do to like, make the wrist more flexible, to relax your arm completely. And you are, when you're doing double strokes, you're doing both of them as opposed to what I would normally do, which is sort of, you throw it down and get two for free, you know? Mm-hmm. It's both. Everything is articulated completely. And Interesting. Yeah, and never any buzz roll. Hmm. Do and they think the buzz I, rolls are like lazy, lazy American way to do it? <laughs> I did speak to one guy who was like, oh, the Americans, they did the buzz roll. <laughs> <laughs> the French is clear and beautiful. Uh, uh, of course. What was really interesting, though, and to be honest, I, I don't remember a lot of the patterns that they taught me. You know, they had, they gave me all these things to, to learn and this accent pattern and all of this. But what I really remember was sort of more just the overall attention to detail that they had about everything. Basically, the idea is that if you have a problem anywhere, you have a problem everywhere. Hmm, interesting. And so he was critiquing my posture in a way that I hadn't really, that hadn't really been, you know, done to me before in a drum lesson where. I was, everything was also standing, right? We're not sitting, we're standing at the drum. And he would say like, oh, you have tension in your left ankle. <laughs> wow. And I'd be like, what are you talking about? And he's like, yeah, like the way you're standing, your left ankle has like a bit more weight on it than your right. Huh. And he's like, that's going to mess you up. <laughs> wow. He, he's uh, probably right though. I mean, it all adds up to. Cleaner. He was extremely aware of like the body, the dynamics, the anatomy of it. At one point, he criticized me. He said, you're standing with an American posture. I was slouching a little bit. Mm. Um, and they were adamant about that, that your entire body has to be in line and precise and exacting. Wow. And you have to hold your entire body to a high standard to be a tambour. 
I, to be a, a, you know, a, a French drummer. <laughs> I wonder how um, Buddy Rich would do in that situation, getting criticized by a bunch of French guys about his posture. I think he might have exploded a little bit on him. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Wow. Well, yeah, that's cool, though, that you had that. I mean, so he would play an exercise, then you would play it, then you would go back and forth. Did you feel like you really understood it when you left or did you leave going, what just happened? I mean, how, how did you feel? I felt like I kind of got it. It took me a while to sort of process it. I was also really sick. <laughs> I was going to say you had a fever <laughs> but, dream and forgot yeah, everything. I was, I was like, did that really happen? <laughs> um, but the thing that I took away from it, in addition to that really detail-oriented style of practice and precision, was just the overall spirit with which they approached the drum. and. For me to be there and just when they would play these patterns, you know, demonstrate, I could see it in this man, Yvonne's face. It would take him into this reverie and he would just be filled with so much joy to hear the sound of the drum. Mm. And they just loved talking about it. They loved playing it. They loved hearing it. They loved teaching it. And obviously they, they take what they do very seriously because they're keepers of a historical and artistic tradition. But they also, they just love it. They had so much fun and it was cool to see people who loved something so much. Yeah. And that is very contagious. Yeah. Because a lot of times when you're practicing, you're in your basement, you know, and you're working left foot clave and independence exercises, you can be like, oh, God, I, I can't do this anymore. Mm -hmm. It really recharged me in terms of my musical practice just to meet people who had pure love for the drum. And it's a school, like you said. How, I mean, is there a regular group of students who are there? I mean, I, I don't know if you were there on like a weekend or something, but like was, does he, how many students does he typically have? I don't know. It's not very many. Yeah, it's pretty specific. Um, but he also, he runs a troupe. So the Tambour 89, which is uh, like 1789 was the French Revolution. Mm -hmm. And so he is basically the artistic director of this French drum troupe, which often performs at big French cultural events. So over the bicentennial, um, there was a huge parade in Paris. That drum troupe was there performing. Gotcha. And That's I cool. would be willing to bet anything that they'll be in the Paris 2024 opening ceremonies for the Olympics. That's awesome. Yeah, I'm sure yeah. you'll be looking at I would let this, that could be my in, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah. But I, I think just mentioning the Olympics, every opening ceremonies for the past, I don't know, 30 years, has had or opening or closing ceremonies has had drummers in it, which just goes to show you how important rhythm and drumming is to every culture. Yeah, it's sort of like rice. Every culture has its own way of making rice. Sure, every culture has its own way of playing the drum, and it's always a point of pride. Like in the just in the Tokyo one, they had the taiko drummers. Yeah, it's like this is a this is a this is our sonic badge. This is a symbol of our culture. Yeah, that thing is very cool. So yeah. I'm almost I I could say I'll I'll put money on it that it's going to be. Uh, in the next one too and it'll be French so it'll be even better <laughs> <laughs> yeah it'll be extremely complicated <laughs> yeah uh, then one particular line that this man said during the interview when I because I was also filming this my, my brother came with me and he filmed the whole day yeah yeah and then we sat down I just sat down with him and did an interview uh, in between our bouts of me learning like whatever French pata fla fla <laughs> 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 I just asked him very simply, like, what is the tambour? Like, what is the drum? And his answer is something I have literally been thinking about for years and only have recently started to understand it. So at the time, one, I literally didn't understand it because it was in his, like, Breton dialect. But then I, also the words were very complicated. He said, the drum, I was expecting him to say just, oh, the, yeah, the drum is two taut membranes on a wooden cylinder and yada, yada, yada. He said, that the drum is a system that allows someone to express their feelings. Mm. A system. Yeah, it's a system. Wow. I'll say it again. The drum is a system that allows someone to express their feelings. What do you take that to mean? I have thought about it a lot and... I think that with that sort of definition, 
you can arrive at a theory of percussion, which is on the one hand, it's, it's, it's both liberating and it's also, it reveals a lot. Um, basically you can boil it down to the fact that the drum is a communication device. Yeah. It's a musical instrument, but it's really a device for communication. I think that's what he's saying when he's saying system, that it's not just a musical instrument. It's a way to communicate stuff. Literally in the military sense, retreat, turn right, march. Literally the rhythms mean something direct. Yeah. And that continues, I think today. And I take that now when I'm playing the drums or making one of these videos, I'm trying to communicate something as opposed to just playing the drums or you know, how fast can I play? How cool can I look when I play? It's really more about figuring out what you have to say and using the drums as a system to amplify that message. Hmm. I, the drum is really just an amplifier. It's sort of just like holding a megaphone up to your own personality. Sure. And so yeah, really. that's, that's how I take that. that and I also yeah. find it interesting just as, thinking about the drums compared to other musical instruments that when you're playing the drum set, I feel like it's sort of, it's a unique thing you know, the trap drum set. You're very untethered to the instrument itself. Like a pianist needs a full blown piano. Mm -hmm. Like you have to have a piano and a piano is sort of, obviously there are great pianos and bad, bad pianos, but a piano is a piano. Yeah. A guitarist needs a guitar and every guitar kind of pretty much is the same when you boil it down. Sure. But a drummer, like think about drum setups, it's a wild variation from like just one drum set to the next. Like the instrument itself is sort of very mutable and, and malleable. And so what is the drums? Right? Yeah. A piano, like a piano is this. It has this and it has that, it has the keys and the hammers, and it, it does that. But the the drums, it's not really a you know a thing. It's more of an idea. Something you hit. It's something you hit, yeah. Um, yeah. To convey a message. Right. Yeah. Wow. This got deep. It, it is really deep. <laughs> um, and I think that is also why I think it's important to learn about your instrument. The number one advice I could give to any musician, and now I'm in a position where people ask me for advice, which is interesting. Um, but the number one advice I could give to anyone who's saying, how can I get better at my instrument? How can I improve my sound? How do I sound better? My advice is to learn the history of the instrument because it will actually improve your sound, not because of any technique or trick, but because talking about drums, the weight of your stick then comes down with the full force of tradition. And then knowing what to play or how to play it becomes almost self-evident when you insert yourself now into that timeline mm. with a knowing respect for what came before and I suppose an eagerness to innovate what should come next. Yeah. And so that's really what I took away from my, my big uh, aventure, my big adventure. <laughs> uh, yeah. Which is that I now feel so connected to a whole history of drumming, which I previously really wasn't. Like I l knew kind of about the history of jazz and baby das and, you know, New Orleans and, and that whole scene. And they went up to New York and they took the train to Chicago and all this stuff. And it's great. Um, but uh, going back even further really um, opened my eyes and made me want to learn even more. You know, you learn about the like drumming from Africa and the diaspora yeah. and how that influenced all these rhythms. And it really will just blow your mind. Yeah. And so it just keeps going back. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I've gotten really into meditation lately. And um, David Lynch, a big meditator. Yeah. I love David Lynch. He has this quote, which I, I heard not too long ago, which I think is apropos. He says that if, if you have a golf ball sized consciousness, when you read a book, you will have a golf ball sized understanding of the book. When you look out, a golf ball sized awareness. And when you wake up, a golf ball-sized wakefulness. So if you meditate, 
you expand your consciousness and expand your understanding of the book when you read it. Mm. When you look out, you have an expanded awareness. And when you wake up, you have an expanded wakefulness. Now, of course, to editorialize that, that comes incrementally over a long, long period of time. Sure. But the same, I think, can be said for music and learning music history. Uh, if you have a limited knowledge of your instrument's history, your sound and creativity becomes equally as limited. So if you have you know, an inch-long understanding of the history of drums, when you play a swing beat, you only have an inch-long understanding of how to do it, or better yet, why and when to do it. You know, um, that you won't know that swing and jazz used to be dance music and it has to groove and people have to dance to it and that you should feather the bass drum on all four beats, Yeah, right? Yeah. Because that actually goes back to marching band music, which again goes back to this military thing. Man, I mean, it's just, uh, it's so much deeper than just hitting a drum. You know what I mean? And I think hopefully people get that from listening to this show. And I'm just honored to have people like you who... Um, God, I mean, you just, I'm so happy I had you on and just obviously what you're doing online is super cool. And it's just, it's neat though, that like, um, to give you a platform for this, where you can talk about this kind of stuff and teach us all about this and your experience, um, and just your really interesting and neat perspective on everything, um, which you're, you're wise beyond your years. Um, so I think you've, you've, you're internalizing it. And I think people can kind of, you know, at any age, at any juncture of your drumming career, people can take inspiration from what you're saying, um, and dig deeper, um, and just kind of love the drums. That's what this is all about. Um, so why don't we, as we're kind of wrapping up here, we're going to do a little bonus episode for a couple minutes, but I want to take a, you know, a minute here. Maybe, I mean, you're obviously a big time guy on social media where I feel like most people have probably seen one or two of your videos, even if I'm they, a big time guy, <laughs> you're a big time guy, <laughs> where can people find you? And, and then uh, obviously, you know, we can talk about the documentary for a long time, but you do have a trailer out about your experience. Um, and then maybe you can just quickly talk about your intention of, of releasing it and all that good stuff. So you can just look me up, Josh Harmon. You can find me on Instagram. The handle is Josh underscore Harmon underscore. But if you just type in Josh Harmon, it comes right up. Uh, YouTube, Josh Harmon. TikTok, at Josh Plays Drums. You'll find me. Um, and then on the YouTube channel, you can see, if you're interested in more about French drumming, you can see the trailer for the documentary that I made about it, uh, which is, the name of the movie is called La Poursuite du Rhythme or the English translation would be keeping the beat. And so you can find that on my YouTube channel. It's pretty, it's pretty far down in there. I'll but share it. it. Is there. I'll share yeah. it on the notes so people can click it if they listen. And the full movie is about uh, 40 minutes long, but it, when I originally performed it at Amherst, I performed the drum score live. So the way it's meant to be viewed, and this is like, <laughs> I feel like such a uh, haughty, like auteur of my film here, <laughs> but basically it's designed to be viewed in conjunction with a live snare drummer. And so hopefully I'm uh, at some point, maybe when things are, it's easier to, to do, um, to release it. I was briefly in talks with the, the cultural embassy of France in New York city to do a screening. Wow. So I'm hopeful, I'm hopeful that that, that will pan out. Uh, also I have an entire book that I've written about this topic, which goes through the history of the snare drum. It goes way deeper into all the stuff that we talked about today. And it also has a focus in its final chapter on the role of the snare drum in the French Revolution, which is something that we didn't even get into. Um, but it is really, really interesting. Mm. And I sort of philosophize about the metonymic function of the snare drum uh, in a revolution. And that's something that, which has a lot of parallels to modern times. And I think we could all learn a lot from the humble drum. Yeah. So that will hopefully, I don't know, at some point be released as an actual thing. Cool. I'll keep you posted. Yeah. Yeah. So Josh is going to be kind enough to take, you know, 10 minutes or so and uh, hang out and talk to me a little bit more for the bonus episode this week. 
which is on Patreon. And if you listen to the show, you probably know by this point, you can go to drumhistorypodcast.com, click the Patreon button and join up for a couple bucks and you get these bonus episodes. And um, we're going to talk about, you know, it'd, it'd be silly to not talk a little bit about your experience with all this social media stuff, because um, we've you know talked a lot about this very deep French stuff. So let's talk about more, you know, TikTok and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, something uh, a bit more levi- levite. <laughs> yes, exactly. So if you want to hear that, check it out. Super easy to find. Um, but equally deep. Equally deep. Was, uh, we're going to do some real philosophizing about uh, TikTok. Yes. And trends. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Challenges and all that stuff. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Eating Tide Pods. Very, it's very, yeah, it's good totally. Stuff. We'll talk. We'll cover all that. So, um, yeah, again, Josh, thanks for coming on the show. And I should say, too, thanks to the working drummer guys for having you on. And they this one wasn't really a recommended episode, quote unquote, like I get a lot of. This is just one where I went a- actively. They said, don't, don't, don't have him. <laughs> yeah, they were like, we don't recommend him. No, I, again, yeah. I heard it and I went, man, yes, instantly. Got to have you on. Um, and I'm so happy that you came on. So thank you for doing this. Hey, it's my pleasure. Thanks for being that one guy who said, hey, you know what? Tell me about that French drum thing. <laughs> so I appreciate that. That's what I do. Awesome. Thanks, Josh. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning. <laughs>